but definitely not least, she is the founder and chief investment officer at Safket Capital Management. This is a primary fund. It's short only focused on high conviction opportunities where investigative and forensic methods are used to access possible fraud, criminality, and consumer abuse, among other predatory activities. She regularly advocates for a deeper understanding of the market utility of short selling, including pushing for fairer short selling treatment, stronger fraud reporting protocols, also in Germany, and we're going to talk about that, as well as lobbying against onerous public disclosure laws for short positions in the US and Europe. A warm welcome to Fami Kadir. So probably a lot of people here in that room might know you for a very famous story of Wirecard. And that certainly has something to do with distrust and mistrust. When you're looking back at, um, at being one of the first and female short sellers and mistrusting that maybe story too good to be true, how important was distrust and be maybe a mistrusting person on that story? Well, I guess to frame what I do in the context of today's discussion, I'm a professional practitioner of mistrust. Uh, the way I make money is by finding what is wrong and what corporations are portraying to their consumers and to the broader public. Um, so my investors, they, they give me money to be skeptical. Uh, so naturally, that means that whenever I see a story, I'm going to be asking questions. It isn't about necessarily being cynical or ad automatically distrusting um, what a company says, but it's about having a sense of what, is, what adds up, what makes sense, um, what is blatantly untrue. Um, the, the issue is when we find ourselves in periods of economic prosperity, especially, um, so boom cycles like we've seen for the last 15 years, even if investors or the public are skeptical, they will turn a willfully blind eye away from whatever problems there may be. So sometimes these problems may be obvious, but no one wants to stand in the way of a good story. Um, increasingly, especially in Western economies, econ economic prosperity really depends on financial products. So it's more about the sale of stocks and bonds rather than the sale of, of physical products. Um, so when we want to feel good about the state of the world and our economy within our country, what really means a lot to us is how do stocks perform? So for Germany, the, the economy was really based on manufacturing and the industrial complex that it's had for many centuries. Um, so how do you move forward into the 21st century? Of course, you want to start invest, investing in technology. So Wirecard, of course, regardless of the merits of the business itself or the technology itself, the fact that it could stand on the international stage and call itself a technology company meant it automatically got the support of the systems around it. And that means institutions, the public, everyone is less willing to trust their instincts of mistrusting what is being said because they believe the benefits of you know, the, the stock rise, the financial success of this business means more to the country's success. I looked up the difference between mistrust and distrust. So mistrust would be the lack of faith based on discomfort or intuition, and distrust more the lack of faith based on knowledge or experience. Yet in, in the case of Wirecard, is it one more than the other? Is it a combination, or how do you deal with that? I would say it's a combination of both. Um, and in any instance, what I really like to look at is the intentions of whatever fraud is being committed um, and what are the opportunities or incentives to commit that fraud um, and, and what kind of language are you using to commit that fraud. Um, and any kind of corporate fraud, if you, you can really identify all of these three things, you understand 
um, that there is going to be some sort of disconnect between the company's public story and what's going on behind the curtains. And with Wirecard, they really relied on overcomplicating their story. So they gave you a lot of information and hundreds of pages, thousands of pages of documents. And they had subsidiaries all over the world with different laws and regulations governing each of them. And they expanded so exponentially over the last decade of its existence that it became increasingly difficult to actually understand and analyze what was happening at, the, at that business. Is it information overload? So you're being purposely complicated in order to ensure that your, your public, whoever is consuming your story, is less able to understand it and then thereby less able to ask questions of it. Um, so for that, I would say it's, it's both distrust and, and mistrust, because in many cases, you aren't even aware that this is happening. Because if you have a situation you can't get a handle on, how are you supposed to understand whether you can trust it or not anyway? Going back to what Samarth just said as an investigative journalist, uh, investigative journalism played a very important role at Wirecard as well. The Financial Times did an amazing job. Dan Crum did an amazing job. How, I mean, you weren't aligned, of course, because it, it's separate worlds, but are there similarities in double checking the story when you are mentioning the documents and overcomplicating the story as well? Are you some sort of editor in, in like a financial narrative they're, they're telling? So what, what I like to say about journalism is that they are the storytellers and people like me, the short sellers, we're, we're executing on a story. Mm -hmm. um, so we work on different timelines, but ultimately we have the same goals. And if we think about fraud more generally in public markets, who's actually incentivized to do anything about it, um, especially in, in you know, a prosperous, virtuous kind of cycle? Government, like we said, not necessarily going to step in, step in the way of corporate prosperity. Um, you have whistleblowers that might be within a company, but you have to understand that those whistleblowers are not incentivized to do anything about what's going on, right? They stand to lose their livelihood. They stand to be sued by their employer. They stand to be blacklisted from future employment. Um, we've even seen cases where where corporate whistleblowers have actually faced mortal danger um, and harassment uh, from their former employers. So whistleblowers aren't always in the best position. Auditors, so the external auditors that are hired by the company um, to provide an annual review of a company's financials, the auditors, they usually do a pretty good job, um, to be fair. I would say most fraud is stopped by the auditors before it gets too large and too systemic um, to do anything about it. Um, but there is a, something to be said, again, about willful blindness. If an auditor with the same audit partner is auditing a company for over 10 years, even though the auditor still is mindful of its duty, it becomes a lot more difficult for that auditor to separate the personal trust that they may have in those who are providing that information, and then their professional duty to mistrust some of that information. Um, so, so that's a conflict. But then you have journalists who can make a career, as Dan McCrum has done, after reporting on whistleblower information. And then, of course, as short sellers, we are financially incentivized to uncover and do something about fraud. Um, so the incentives for us are aligned with the outcomes here. Um, that said, Dan McCrum was able to speak with people who were directly involved at Wirecard. They were employees of Wirecard. Whereas as someone who's trading in public markets, I simply can't, for legal reasons, I can't access that information because it would be considered insider trading and I never want to put myself into that position. So we had to approach it from a different angle um, and we had to look at it from an angle that the public was not necessarily looking at, that the journalists were not necessarily, necessarily looking at, but that one where we could dig in, do something, get information, but then also present that information to someone who might care. So because Wirecard had expanded into the US, we thought, as Americans, that's an obvious angle for us because no one was looking there. 
Um, and this is a financial institution that is dealing with US dollars. So obviously, anything that might be considered fraud, criminality, or money laundering would matter a lot to the US government. So we, we focus on that angle, and we had to exclusively use publicly available sources, or we had to use individuals who were not employees of Wirecard. So you have to get really creative about how you corroborate your information. Um, and how you develop your sources. And the thing is, when you're looking at things like money laundering, your, your sources are not perfect. You know, the, you're usually speaking to another criminal themselves. So it's about understanding the, the credibility of your sources and when you're processing that information, how do you put it in the context of whatever intentions that source might have. Um, so it's, it's about you know, finding an angle where we can kind of use our own levers, where we can actually affect change while also still actively being able to trade the stock. Talking about becoming more creative in finding sources and corroborating the story, um, maybe bringing back in what Claire said, what role does empathy play? What role does it play to, yeah, put yourself in, in the other shoes of, I don't know, another criminal or the CEO almost minds? Well, I'll, I'll come at this from a more um, positive angle of empathy, as in maybe I'm an unusual case within my industry, but the reason I do this is because I have a fundamental distaste for the abuse of public trust. So it's my empathy for those who are being abused that drives me to do this work, which can be dangerous and excruciating and, and very costly um, personally and financially. You know, I do it because I love it and because I want to see the positive change in markets. But of course, this is about understanding what is the next move, right? This is about getting into the head of those who are running these businesses, understanding what stresses them, what, though they're never gonna tell me the truth, when, they, when I ask them questions, which questions will make them sweat? Um, and and how, does, how do their behaviors change over time? Um, you know, for example, Jan Marslik, who is the, the co-founder of COO, who's you know, on the run in Russia, he, it was about two weeks before Wirecard collapsed. Uh, he, it was his 40th birthday party, um, and he was two bottles of vodka, drinking alone, falls over, is mumbling on the ground. So clearly, there, there was distress there two weeks before the stock ever collapsed. So I when, guess you weren't invited, though. You know that from a source. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, short sellers are sometimes also being mistrusted and criticized for making profit out of negative events that mean losses for other people. Can you, can you understand that? I absolutely understand it because it comes from a place of not understanding. Uh, most people don't really understand. They're not connected to financial markets directly, so they don't really know what short sellers do. And therefore, it's always easy, it's convenient for fraudsters and other, others with malintentions to then use that misunderstanding to, to demonize short sellers. So, I, you know. I, I'll continue to do the work that I do. I don't think public perception of short sellers is ever going to change. Because as people, I think we always want to believe that everything is going to be OK, that companies are telling us the truth, and that they will succeed. So it's, it's, some, you know, it's core to our human nature. You know, We've gotten this far because we have that belief. So the idea that someone is going to stand in the way of that, I think it doesn't really jive uh, with how we are as people. So I respect that. Um, and I don't think, you know, no matter how much I try to say that this is a virtuous act, I don't, I don't think people are going to buy it. <laughs> are you still, I asked the question, the other ones before as well. Do you become more and more skeptical? And does it mean more and more professional and better at your job? And how do you, do you deal with that, like, within your character? Is it something the, the private family is, is totally different from the, from the investor? You can't separate your personal self from what you do, especially when it's your own business. So I'd say being a short seller is fundamentally part of my identity. That being said, if you're going to be a really good short seller, you have to be fundamentally optimistic. Because if you get mired in the, 
this overly cynical kind of nature, it's very easy to not only burn yourself out, but then to just start seeing phantoms. So seeing fraud everywhere and not being able to see the good. And then you're less likely to be able to question yourself. You sort of lose that self-awareness. So for me, when I was first starting out, I was definitely going down that path of becoming very disenchanted with everything and everyone, not being able to trust anything. But now it's, it's become much more of an active process where I really do want to engage and I do want to trust and I want to believe that things will be good. So when there are situations where there's that abuse of trust, I want to do something about it. I want to be constructive, not just to get you know, stuck into my, my own cynicism. I can imagine that it must be quite challenging during, for example, again, Wirecard, it, that was some sort of a long process as well. It, it wasn't a matter of days or weeks. Um, it, was, it was a very long, maybe, yeah, let's call it campaign from both sides. Um, how do you deal with balancing the, the mistrust and at the same time trusting your instinct on that and trusting that you, you have the, the right view on it and will yeah, and will be given right at the end. It's hard work. It, you just really need to, to do the work, put in the, the steps, go speak to the sources, and always, always, always question yourself. If I don't understand, you know, if there's some source of uncertainty, then I will try to devise a strategy to minimize that uncertainty. But, you know, it's never a static sort of position. You're always thinking about what more can you do? How do you modify your point of view? Um, did things change? Um, and being willing to, to actually see things change. And then once you do all of that, once you have that process in place and you force yourself to stick to it, you can deal with the, the stock price going up you know, 20% one day for, for no apparent reason. You can have conviction in your ideas, and, and that's you know, where the strength comes, being able to say that you've done the work and that you've exhausted every avenue that you could. When you do that, you have to stand by your work. Otherwise, you know, what's the point? Looking at society, um, I think right now, but maybe it has always been the case, there's also a certain fascination for the, I don't know if it's bad guys or uh, we have also the story about Elizabeth Holmes with the one drop, it's also a story too good to be true, but she was on the cover of the, of the Times and got lots of investors. We have a Netflix series about inventing Anna, uh, also a, a fake identity based, a ba yeah, based on nothing. Do you think it's like a part of the human nature finding those stories with a little, and not even, not, not too little actually, uh, criminal intent somehow fascinating? Really, it's, it's the, the same reason why people love true crime documentaries. I th when you're not the victim, you're not directly impacted by a crime, there is something, there's a morbid fascination that comes from, you know, the capacity of another human to commit evil acts or to, to abuse vulnerable populations. Um, I think we're, we're definitely attracted to that because, you know, I think first of all, we're glad that it wasn't us. I think a lot of people like to think, you know, I, I would never be in that situation. They couldn't do that to me. Um, but, you know, why, why do I like to watch scary movies? It's, it's just a reminder that there is, you know, a part of human nature that, that isn't all nice and, and friendly and, and you know open to advancing and progressing as one um, that is there to, to take advantage of us. But I would say, you know, even though that element is a constant, there will always be those charlatans and those grifters and those frauds. What we can do, the rest of us, is do everything in our power to mitigate the effect that those individuals have. So, you know, over the last 15 years, just because there's been so much money in the system, it's, it's almost been as though we don't care that this fraud is happening because we just need places to put the money. And I think what we're learning now, as more of some of this fraud starts to come to surface, uh, it'll again, we'll learn from our mistakes. Um, individuals, including, you know, the, the broader public will learn uh, to, to ask more questions about where money is going. Um, yeah, and, and the cycle restarts. The broader public can ask <laughs> more questions. You can ask questions now if you have some. Otherwise, I have many, many, many more. But uh, this, is, this is for you. There's one question. 
And there's the microphone. Hello. Yeah. So, Fami, uh, how does a mind, like a, a short seller and a venture capitalist, you know, both are like investing money, venture capitalist has to be slightly more optimistic, I guess. So we hear the model that out of 10 investments, even if like eight fail and two work, they're okay. But the skill set is that similar, you know, you analyze companies. So I'm just trying to understand, like, can you be like an equally good venture capitalist? How, what's the difference? So uh, because venture capitalists are dealing with private companies for the most part, they have access to private, you know, non-public information that as a short seller, I don't have access to. So, you know, I can't engage in short selling transactions on private companies. So that in that sense, it's very different. If I had access to that information that the venture capitalists had, then maybe I could deter them from making those investments. But, th but this is the thing with, because there's been so much money in private equity and venture capital, those billions and billions and hundreds of billions of dollars need an exit. And what is the exit? The exit is public markets. Um, you know, it's the, you know, retiree, it's you and me. Um, and we, we are basically the greater fool for those venture capital firms. And they definitely understand this as we've seen with everything that's gone on with FTX and you know, everything that's gone on within the crypto space. Venture capital knows that they are putting their money into dubious investments, but they just have so much money. Um, and, you know, it's greed. It's late stage capitalism. And so we'll see where the experiment takes us. Any more questions at the moment? I don't see one, so I continue for the moment. Um, one could think that in 2023, through social media, where everyone could be a reporter, everyone working at Wirecard or somewhere else uh, is, 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 is telling a story through any social platform. One could think that things become more and more transparent and more and more difficult maybe to, uh, yeah, position a narrative that is not true. And somehow at the same time, or at least it seems to be in a globalized world that these frauds happening more and more. What's your, what's your take on that? I, I wouldn't say they're happening more and more. I think again, just as a product of the liquidity that's been in the system, these frauds have gotten larger than they've ever been. Um, so, so we see them a lot more. Um, that said, I think this is, you know, the role of systems and, and regulations. Regulations have changed the way that markets have functioned over the last century. So, you know, if you look at U.S. markets before something like Sarbanes-Oxley, which forces the disclosure of, you know, basic financial information and, you know, an annual report and quarterly reports for investors, you know, before that, there was no information. You know, what, what are investors supposed to base their decisions on? Um, before the, the SEC, so the U.S. securities regulator, they used to just have physical copies in their office of the reports of these publicly traded companies, and now it's all available on the internet. So I think regulators play a very important role in ensuring that corporations are giving us the disclosures that are responsible and necessary for us to make our informed decisions. Um, and they need to really stick to the guide rails because what we've learned in this last period is that companies will find some way around the regulations to, again, confuse and manipulate and mislead investors. So again, regulation needs to evolve as markets evolve. Talking about evolving, especially, and we've talked before a lot of about um, privileged minorities and the question who is even able to participate in, in certain dis discourses and um, the financial world and the financial system definitely also could probably use some sort of innovation and uh, democratization. Do you see that there is a certain trend in that also maybe through, through apps that are, that are more accessible than, than maybe a financial system or even the internet, microcredits, mm -hmm. cryptocurrency? Would you, would you have an optimistic outlook on that? Yeah, I think that everyone should have the ability to build generational wealth through access to financial markets. I believe that's you know, a fundamental right for everyone. Um, but that being said, there is a fine line between building wealth and just sort of mass speculation and gambling and taking advantage of these investors who are just you know, retail investors and not 
educated the same way that professional investors are. Um, so that's definitely a fine line. So I think the greatest advancement for the broader public as far as financial markets has been the access to being able to buy very low cost or no cost exchange traded funds, which are just broad portfolios of lots of different companies that will have a steady, you know, but you know, not crazy return. But I think this pandemic era of um, mass speculation. This happens in every market cycle. Um, so even if you go back to the dot-com bubble, there were individual investors who were gathering online on places like GeoCities and Yahoo Finance to speculate on stocks. So I think it's, this is again, it's, you know, your neighbor is day trading stocks, so you think you can do the same. I think a lot of this behavior sort of washes out once the market you know, resets its cycle. Um, but that said, I think the incremental changes in, in making products safe, uh, legitimate products available to investors uh, is definitely the way forward. I still have the legitimate product of a Yahoo email address. <laughs> um, any more questions? Last chance for your questions. We have to finish quite. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so my, last, um, my last question would be, do you think Germany has learned from Wirecard if you're going to be quite unemployed in this country <laughs> on short selling anything. Uh, it's been great uh, since post Wirecard and post any big corporate scandal, governments usually enact lots of change and is, you know, they're very diligent in the aftermath. The question is how long does that last? Will we remain diligent um, after this market cycle resets? Um, I, I hope they are. Uh, but the changes they've made post Wirecard, I, I'm definitely in support of. I will conclude this panel because we <laughs> talked a lot about it. I asked ChatGPT before uh, this panel, would you trust Fami Kadir? I don't know if you ever asked ChatGPT <laughs> that. As an AI language model, I don't have personal opinions on the ability to trust individuals. Trust is a subjective judgment that varies from person to person based on their own experiences, knowledge and perspective. But of course, there's always the answer. Fami Kiddi is a well-known short seller and trust in her would depend on various factors such as the track record, the transparency of her research and methodologies, her ethical conduct and how she communicates her findings. I think you did that very well. And I think um, <laughs> we can trust you for now. Thank you so much. Thank you. Fami Kadia.